knowing that whenever we were lost and sinners, that he came and paid a price for us. Amen. You, know, you may all be seated this evening. 
Um, if the ushers could go ahead and head this way. I just got a few announcements. Um, so this coming Sunday, uh, we will have a table out in the front honoring uh, Joel and Kaylin. Uh, they'll be getting married, um, and they are registered at Amazon and Target. Amen. I'll just make sure I got that right. And then um, next weekend, uh, Saturday, um, the 29th, uh, me and Sister Miranda will be getting married uh, at 3 o'clock. Uh, and then prime timers, uh, they'll be meeting Friday, August 4th at 12 p.m. Uh, in the HTCA gym. Uh, Brother Richard will be cooking. Um, if you could please see Sister Vicki uh, for sides and desserts. And then also uh, um, Life and Purpose group, um, there'll be uh, co-ed softball. And that'll be happening, uh, let's see, August 5th at 7 o'clock at Lindsay Field Park. And so uh, we'd love if y'all could come out and join us for that. Um, and... Uh, Amen. Uh, Brother Richard, if you could bless the offering. and singers. Uh, Brother Darren, if you could come ahead. Um, there'll be no Wednesday night classes tonight. Um, and just uh, remember uh, the kids, they're at camp this week, and uh, Brother Matt and Sister Tori, they're out as well. Just keep them in your prayers. And uh, just uh, let's just get in with him and just uh, open our hearts to receive what the Holy Spirit has, to, has for us. Amen. Good evening. Just think about all these young people getting married. Um, you know, one of them, I could tell you who it is. I don't want to they here tonight? They said, Brother Aaron, you've been married a long time. And he said, what's the best advice you can give me? I said, oh, gosh. I said, all I can tell you is that love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. <laughs> you know, <laughs> after a few months, you'll know what I'm talking about. But... <laughs> well, 33 years ago tomorrow, my wife and I got married at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And... Um, I wish I knew then what I know today. I've been a lot better husband and 
father. Um, matter of fact, the week before we got married, I was a youth pastor. And the week before we got married, I was at youth camp. And when I say the week before, I mean the week of. I got back Friday at 1 o'clock. Matter of fact, Laura and I was laughing about this this morning. But we got back Friday at 1 o'clock, and our wedding rehearsal was that night. I got married the next day. Went on a honeymoon for a week and came back, and I took her to Mexico on a mission trip. And um, I think she probably didn't realize I was going to drag her around the world as much, but uh, we're both very grateful for it thankful for God. You know, God's good to us all the time. He's just in all his ways, but he's also good in all his ways. You know, God gets it right the first time. He never says, oops. He doesn't have a plan B, plan C. He gets it right the first time. Well, I want to share a passage tonight, a story, a picture within a picture that I've looked at for many years, and it's amazing how the Bible is endless. Look at the same passage, and every year, you, it wasn't there before. But it's amazing how the Bible is just endless. And so as a passage tonight and a thought tonight, I'd like to maybe help paint a picture. I believe on my own life that this story represents our nation today as never before. God's word is timeless. It applies to all generations. Everything will pass away, but God's word will remain forever. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. I'm sure every one of us in this room most likely has more than one copy of this love letter to us, to your people. Most of the world is yet to see a word of it. Thank you tonight, God, that we can sit in our fellowship with freedom, we can worship you, we can give, we can rightly divide the word of truth. But I pray tonight that you would help us to, to know you better when this night is finished. That we will apply what we have seen in your word to our life. Lord, let us be as the Bereans, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they hungered for the word of God with great eagerness, but tested everything to see if it was so. Let us be as Micah, that you have shown us, O man, what is good, that may we may do what's just and love mercy and to walk humbly before our God. Father, may the words in my mouth and meditations in my heart be acceptable to you tonight, who's our God and our rock and our redeemer. In your wonderful son's name we pray. Amen. I've heard a statement often in the last 20 years in church world is that The method doesn't matter as long as a message is preached. But that's not true. The method does matter. The method can alter the message or hinder the message or change the message. And I want us to see that tonight in God's word. We're going to take 11 verses, read them together. But it's a small snippet of most likely 210 verses of this whole picture. First, Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 through 10. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. Second Samuel 6, 1 through 11. David chose all the choice men of Israel, 30,000 men. I was in van this morning and I was thinking about this message. There's 2,245 people in the city limits of van. Anybody know what van is? Well, you have to want to go there on purpose. But there's 2,245 people. David had put together 15 times the city of Van. Choice men. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up thence the ark of God, whose name is called by that name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. And brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God in Ohio. It's one of those names. I've practiced him several times, but it's A-H-I-O. Before the ark. 
And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, harps, psalm trees, tambourines, cornets, and cymbals. When they came to Nikon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark and took hold of it for the oxen shook or stumbled. The anger of the Lord was kindled against us, and God smote him there that day for his irreverence or for his error and died there before the ark. And David was displeased because there was a breach upon Uzzah. Verse 9, and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. But David carried aside into the house of Obadiah the Gittite. And the Lord continued in the house of of Obadiah to get tight three months. And the Lord blessed Obadiah and all of his household. See, David was wanting to do the right thing. There's 30,000 choice men. Everything was perfectly organized. They had the best musicians. They had the best instruments, cornets, cymbals, trumpets. These trumpets were set up in such a way that when, they, when those trumpets blasted, it would draw attention that something of utmost royalty was coming. Everything was perfect. Can you imagine 30,000 people? David inquired of the men ahead of time, this is what I want to do. I want to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to where it belongs, to, the, to Jerusalem. Are you with me? Absolutely. So David was designed to do the right thing. And even though everything seemed perfectly right on the outside, the motive was there, the structure was there, the picture was there, the workers were there, everything was there externally, but something was wrong on the inside. And so David begins this procession with the ark. And you have to go back to Numbers chapter 7 and 1 Samuel chapter 4, and we want tonight to begin to get the backdrop of this story. Israel found himself in a battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines was always a thorn in their side, but at this particular time in the history of Israel, the Philistines were a very formidable foe. They were very organized. Their weapons of war were second to none. And the culture of that day, the religions of the world of that day, they would often bring their God down to the front of the battlefield, believing that their God would help them win that battle, to help them secure a proper victory. Well, Israel was led by the prophet Samuel, and they had a high priest named Eli, and he had two worthless boys. Now, I don't call them worthless. God does. Let me tell you something. If God calls you worthless, you're in trouble. And he said they were worthless because they did not know God. They grew up in a priestly home. They grew up around the presence of God. They grew up around the things of God, but they didn't know God. So these boys decide that they want to operate like the Philistines and other nations of the world. And we're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, the picture of Christ, where God met with his people. We're going to take this Ark of the Covenant down to the front line to ensure us a victory. Well, these boys did not understand that the Ark of the Covenant was not a statue. The Ark of the Covenant was not an idol. The Ark of the Covenant was about God, the manifest presence of God, a picture of the atonement, the cross. The reason we're able to sit here tonight was because of that Ark of the Covenant laid a picture in the Old Testament for what was to come. But these two worthless boys takes this precious Ark of the Covenant down to the front lines, hoping to win the battle. We know the story that they were decimated that day because God is not going to allow anybody and anybody in the ministry to use him for their own gain. He's not going to do it, no matter who it is. God is not a means to our end. 
especially those in the ministry. God is not a means to their end. Matter of fact, if you remember, Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he saw the sheep did not have a shepherd and he wept because he had a heart for the sheep, for the church, for those that didn't know God. But men today, they look over Jerusalem and they don't weep because the sheep have no shepherd. They look over Jerusalem and they see the sheep and see how they can use the sheep to build their own kingdoms. That the sheep are a means to their end. They're using the sheep to build their kingdom. And the only time they weep is when someone gets in the way and tells them something or tries to stop them. God's not going to tolerate that. So here's the Ark of the Covenant. And Israel was decimated that day and 30,000 men die. And the Ark of the Covenant was captured. The Philistines, once they got a hold to this Ark of the Covenant, they didn't quite know what to do with it. They brought him into the temple of Dagon. Dagon was a, the most prominent god of the Philistines. They had more than one. I have a picture of this Dagon god, and let me tell you something. He is an ugly fellow. I couldn't be, I couldn't worship a god like that just because he was so ugly, but nevertheless, that's what they did. He was half man and half fish. He had arms, he had a tail, and obviously he had an ugly head. But he was over 50 foot tall. And the temple for Dagon was a massive structure. And so Dagon is set up in this temple. Dagon's purpose, they believe, they prayed to Dagon to be their fertility God for their crops, for grain. That Dagon would bless their food supply. Well, they bring the Ark of the Covenant, which is not nearly that size. And they set the Ark of the Covenant side by side with Dagon. But the next day, when the priests of the Philistines, the lords of the Philistines, come to check things out, they found out that this 50-foot God fell down. And not that he just fell down. He fell down directly on his face in a prostrate position before the Ark of the Covenant. So they set him back up. Came back the next day, and when they opened the door, they find something interesting. This time, not only did he fall in the same position, but when he fell this time, his head came off and so did his arms. And their structure is very large, and his heads and his arms were at the threshold of the doorway that when they came in, they had to step over his head to get in. For centuries following, the Philistines would never step on the threshold because they tied it back to that day. Well, they were terrified by this point already because he was their best God. And they realized this God of Israel, there must be something to him. Because our God not only has fallen down, but in the middle of the night, someone took his head in his arms and carried him about 800 yards across the temple and put his head by the door. So they got together and realized we need to move this Ark of the Covenant to another location. And they moved it around to five different cities over a period of seven months. And everywhere the Ark of the Covenant went, trouble came to the Philistines. It's a little graphic, but it's true. They went to five cities. The first city they went to, there was an outbreak of mice throughout the whole city. How many of you ladies love mice? But you wake up the next morning, and there's mice everywhere. And you know, when God does something, he knows how to do it well. There's mice everywhere. They pack up the Ark of the Covenant and move him on down to, where was Goliath from? Gath. Went to Gath and there was a general outbreak throughout the whole city of tumors. They believe that this mice also caused dysteria. The next city, there was an outbreak of hemorrhoids. Can you imagine having dysteria and hemorrhoids at the same time? The whole city. By the time this seven months is over with, there's mice, there's stomach issues, there's, there's tumors of the groin, there's hemorrhoids. They didn't want to have anything to do with this Ark of the Covenant. So they decided that we're going to pack him up and we're going to send him back. Now, what is this Ark that we are referring to? It was made of acacia wood. Again, the Ark of the Covenant was a picture a type of what was to come. 
The Old Testament is a foundation for the New Testament. The Old Testament is the pictures and types. So it's made of acacia wood. And that acacia wood was a picture of the humanity of Christ. He was fully God and he was fully man. That acacia wood was covered with pure gold, which spoke of the deity of Christ, the pureness of Christ. So you have this box, if you will, that was built of acacia wood, the humanity of Christ, overlaid with gold, speaking of the deity of Christ. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was a lid that was made of one solid bar of pure gold. That lid was also the mercy seat. It was the only piece of furniture that was allowed into the Holy of Holies. And on each side of the Ark of the Covenant was a cherub, and their wings overshadowed the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the mercy seat, under the wings of the shadows, the shadow of the wings was the presence of God. It was the presence of God. How dare those worthless boys Take God and try to use him for their benefit. No fear of God. That's the problem today. We have no fear of God. We think everything carries on from day to day, and we don't see any consequences, so things must be okay. In the Old Testament, men received immediate judgment. In the New Testament, we don't, but we're going to get it at the end of the line. God's view of things are still the same. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, God's law on how his people to live. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was, was the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. It gave ceremonial laws and, and dietary laws and, and moral laws for the nation of Israel. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was, was Aaron's rod that budded that showed God's miracles and God's provision for his people. And the ark as well was a, was a bowl of manna. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the life and the bread that came down from heaven. Anyone eats of me will never hunger, thinks of me will never thirst again. And everything was in an ark of the covenant. And there we have it. We have God overshadowing the ark once again. We have the lawgiver overshadowing the law itself to make provision for the lawbreaker. There it was, all in one package, in one picture. See, folks, God is jealous for himself. He is jealous for his holiness. He is jealous for his, his namesake. He is jealous. God, it's all about him. Our life is not about us. Our ministry is not about us. Our church is not about us. There's nothing in life that's about us. Everything is about him and for him. So there's the Ark of the Covenant. There's a picture. It was a type of what was to come. That Christ came in flesh. He condensed himself to the womb of a woman. Imagine that. God condensed himself to the womb of a woman. Born, lived, sinless, died, rose from the dead. Sit at the right hand of the Father tonight to make intercession for us. So this was the Ark of the Covenant. Again, the wood overlaid with gold showed the union of the human and the divine. The mercy sheet, the bowl of manna, God in the midst of his people. And that's the message that we preach, the Ark of the Covenant. Well, the Philistines decided they need to get rid of this thing. So they go to their priest and the Lords of the Philistines and said, we've had this guy for seven months or this, their God for seven months. What do we do? We have an idea. You need to get a new cart. A new cart that's never been used. And we're going to fix this thing. There's no doubt that something has happened throughout our land for seven months, but we're going to fix this thing and make it as difficult as possible and that if their God sees to it that their God gets back, then we're going to know that we made a right decision to get rid of this thing. So they got a new cart, a cart made of wood that's never been used on wooden wheels that's never been turned. And we're going to place the Ark of the Covenant 
on top of that new cart, and we're going to send it back to the land of Israel. Now, we're not going to use oxen as we normally do. Well, what are we going to use? We're going to use milk cows. Now, I've had a few milk cows in the past. In the past. They're still in the past. Brother Scott, you have a lot of experience with milk cows, and Brother Eugene's had a few, and some other brothers. We want to get milk cows. Well, to have a milk cow, that means you have to have a baby. We're going to get milk cows, not oxen, that has never pulled a cart before. And when we grab a hold to those milk cows, we're going to pull their babies off of them. And we're going to take the babies back home. Well, you know what happens when you pull a calf off the mama? Somebody starts hollering. Them babies want the mama and the mama wants the baby. We're going to pull those calves off. We're going to take them home. And we're going to hitch that cart to milk cows. That's never pulled a cart before. But we don't have a yoke for a milk cow. All we have is a yoke for oxen. So we're going to take the yoke from an oxen, put it on the neck of a milk cow that doesn't fit, pull the babies off, hitch that cart, put the ark on top of that, and we're going to turn it loose and see if it makes it. I would say that was set up. And the Lord of the Philistines say, now you can't just send it back. You have to send it back with some kind of appeasement. So they made some little golden mice. They made some golden tumors. I think it's there by inference, but they put it in there that it was when you get this back, you're going to see a little bit of what we tasted. You got it coming. They didn't understand how it worked. It was two rows to Beth Shemesh. One was eight miles. One was 13 miles. The 13 miles is a perfectly straight road, smooth road. No, no issues, no holes, no problems, no curves. It was a straight path. The other path was eight miles, but it was treacherous and difficult. So the Philistines said, we're going to take this new cart that has never rolled, milk cows that's never pulled, a yoke that belongs on an oxen, put it on the milk cow. We pulled the mamas off and listened to them yell, and we're going to hook this on there, and we're going to turn them loose, and no one's going to lead it, and we're going to see if it makes it back. And folks, sure enough, those cows took off straight. They took the right path, made it all the way to the land of the Israelites, and never had a problem. The Lord of the Philistines followed from a distance off the sides of the road. And when they realized after eight, after 13 miles that the ark made it back, they came back to the Lord of the Philistines and said, boy, we are glad we got rid of that thing. So the ark of the covenant found itself at the home of Abinadab. And it sat there for 50 years. What's interesting, and again, there's all kinds of trails we can take, but I find it interesting that Abinadab was the oldest son of King Saul. Before Saul ever become king, God made sure his presence was in Saul's son's house. And I've pondered in tears the last few days wondering, when Saul needed to hear from God, why did he go find a witch? God's presence is in the house of his son. Tell me, in all those years, he, he couldn't go to his son's house and meet with God. That's why David cried out, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me, because David saw what happened to his father-in-law when God left him. And David prayed that, and I pray, I'd say seven days, I'll say six, make sure I'm honest, but I pray every day, God, do not leave me to myself. You leave me to myself, I won't even know I'm to myself. The worst thing in life is to lose the presence of God, because we lose the presence of God, we don't even know that we lost it. David prayed that, cast me not away from your presence. So the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, found itself in Abinadab's house, the oldest son of King Saul, for at least five decades. David becomes king, and he wants the presence of the Lord back in Jerusalem, the centerpiece of worship. 
And David asked a question that's striking to me. He's lonely without God. He asked the question, how did the ark get here? David knew the Lord. The difference between David and King Solomon, David did some terrible things and paid for it his entire life. The Bible says that David was the song of the drunkard. Once David repented of his sin, God never mentions his sin again, but people did. Stays with him. But David was a man after God's own heart, and he knew how to repent when confronted. David never left God. He allowed himself to get vexed and to grow cold. In disobedience, it cost him. But Solomon left God. What one generation does in moderate, the next generation does in excess. David influenced that boy, and that boy left God. The requirements for kings is, David, you cannot amass gold for yourself. You cannot amass horses for yourself. You cannot amass girls for yourself. David, don't touch the gold, don't touch the glory, and don't touch the girls. First John, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, there it is. The devil only has three tools in his arsenal to damn mankind to hell. It's the same three things, and we all have to keep that in the forefront of our mind. It applies to all of us, because we're all prophets and priests and kings unto the Lord today. And David was required to leave those three things alone. But he also was required to write a copy of the law himself by hand. Write the entire law and to keep it with him night and day that he may learn to fear God. The number one way that we learn to fear of God in our life is by meditating on God's word. So David knew the law. Don't touch the girls, David. Don't touch the glory, David. Don't touch the money. David had no problem when he got the horses, he hamstrung them. David was not supposed to trade horses with Egypt, and he didn't. When he got gold and amassed gold, he gave it to the temple. When it came to the girls, that was his problem. And when David found himself in the case of the open window shade, when kings go off to war in the springtime, David stayed home. That wasn't David's problem then. The problem started 20 years earlier when God says, you can't have more than one wife. The problem started there, and it gradually built, gradually built. And Nathan told him, then there came a traveler. A traveler was just a thought. Davis laid back with undisciplined time. Folks, undisciplined time in our life will always lead us to the greatest weakness in our life. Undisciplined time will always get us in trouble. And so he's laid up in the bed, undisciplined time, and he left the gold alone, and he left the horses alone, but he didn't leave the girls alone. It took 20 years, but it finally got him. And God forgave him, and God used him wonderfully, but it cost him. And so David knew the law. He hand wrote the law. And when he asked the question, how did the Ark of the Covenant get here? David had been through that passage in the law, and he had already written it out. How did he not know? And we'll see in a minute. So those that are around him, everybody's excited. David, the Philistines brought it here on a new car. Great. Did it work? Yeah, no problem. Well, does anybody have a new cart? Sure. So they got a new cart built. And there they go. They take the Ark of the Covenant and they put it on the new cart. David doesn't inquire in the law as well as who's supposed to carry the Ark. Oh, I'll just grab my two nephews. That's who they were. It was David's family. Us in Ohio was David's nephews. It's interesting because Uzzah's name means strength. 
A lot of those names, friendly. And I submit to us tonight, there is so much being done in the church world in America that's not God. And we do it in our own strength, in a seeker-friendly manner. See, David was interested in God's presence, but he wasn't careful to guard God's holiness. And that's where we're at today in the Pentecostal charismatic church world. We want God's presence, but we're not interested in his holiness. And so David gets a new cart, and these two boys begin to lead the oxen. They put the presence of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, on the new cart. And it says when they get to the threshing floor of Nikon, the, the oxen shook. Now, folks, God created this world with one thought. We're spinning right now. We're not falling on our heads. Fish stay in the ocean in salt water, but they're not deteriorated. Don't you think God has the ability to keep that ark from hitting the ground? So they get to Nikon's threshing floor. The oxen stumble, the oxen shook, and Uzzah, the friendly one, the seeker-friendly fella, put forth his hand to study the ark. The Bible says that God struck him there that day for his irreverence. That boy knew because the household he grew up in, he knew that he was not supposed to put his hands on the majesty of God. He was not supposed to put his hands on the presence of God. He was not supposed to steady God the way he wanted him to go. That was a picture of the cross. That was God. He knew better. God's not a tyrant. I've heard God's, guys infer that, and it just makes me furious. That's not true. How is it that those boys grew up in the presence of God their entire life, and he never touched it. His whole entire life, that same ark was in his house, and he never touched it because he knew better. But now he is. He's out on his own, and he has a little authority, and he has some breathing room, and he can make decisions on his own. And the fear of God that he lost, even in the midst of the presence of God, now he's out on his own, and he's doing his own thing. Familiarity bred a contentment. And I'm afraid today, folks, in our Pentecostal world, that we have too many young people that are too familiar with the things of God, too familiar with the presence of God, and don't understand the holiness of God. And understand, God's not a rabbit foot. It's not something. It's not, it's not pogo worship and bouncing around. It's not like that. It's God. And these boys grew up, Uzza grew up around the presence of God. And for decades, he never touched it because he knew better. So here they are. The Bible says that God struck Uzza that day. And the Hebrew is very concrete. I think lightning most likely hit the guy because the Hebrew word was the fellow exploded. 30,000 people come to a stop. All the instruments shut down. Everything seemed to be perfect, but again, folks, the problem was David was doing the right thing the wrong way. He never inquired of God how God wants his work to be done. So David stops, and he asks this question, how will the ark of God come to me? David, how do you ask that question? You already written it out. You know the law. You have God's word. So the presence of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, goes over to Obedidim's house. Stayed there three months. And God blessed his house. See, folks, the thing is that God... Allow the Philistines to do it the wrong way because they are not in covenant with him. 
And God used the world. The Philistines always speak of the world. God used the world for his own means and his own end on his own benefit because they're not in covenant with him. But when it comes to the people of God, he is not going to allow them to do the right thing the wrong way because they're in covenant with him and he's told us how to do it. So here they are. We don't know what happened, but I can tell you what happened. 90 days time. David goes back to that law, and he finds out how God wants his work to be done. And he finds this passage in Numbers, and it tells him that the ones that are to carry the ark are the sons of Kohath, the sin of, of Levites. They're the only ones that could carry the ark. See, on the end of the ark of the covenant was four rings made of acacia wood, the same wood the ark was made of. And those rings were overlaid with gold. And the sons of Kohath would take two sticks, if you will, two staves. And they would pass those sticks and those staves through those four rings. And they would pick up the ark of the covenant and put it on their shoulders and they would carry it. The sons of Kohath were virgin men. They were pure men. They were men that were never been tainted by the world. The Kohathites were never part of any rebellion in Israel. They never celebrated the golden calf or anything like that. And God says, when it comes to my presence, only the holy and pure men can deal with me. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands is my relationship with one another. Pure heart is my relationship with God. How can brothers do well together in unity? It's like oil poured upon Aaron's head, to his robe, to his beard, to his robe, to the ground. The holy anointing all never touched the flesh. And so David finds out in numbers how it should be done. And folks, this is the beauty of it. The Kohites would pick up the presence of the Lord and carry it. Because again, the Ark of the Covenant is a picture. The humanity of Christ overlaid with deity. The law giver overshadowed the law to make provision for the lawbreaker. Because there was going to come a time, a few thousand years in the future, that he who is pictured in the Ark would take two sticks and go through the city of Jerusalem. And that which is pictured and represented in that cross, those two sticks would one day make a cross. And those two sticks represented the humanity of God would be lifted in the air and covered with deity. So you see why God could not allow David to do the right thing the wrong way. If David did the right thing the wrong way and God allowed it, it would destroy the picture of what was to come. It would destroy the type. And God allowed it to go on so long, even though it looked right and even though it seemed good and everything was in place and all the right people and all the right leaders and everything seemed right. God let it go on so long, but he had to stop it because if you let it keep going, it would destroy the work of the cross. So God stopped it. Again, he's not a tyrant. Uzzah lost the fear of God for himself, but David had to stop that procession because it was being done the way the Philistines would do it, the world would do it. So David got it right. He got those Kohites. They carried the Ark of the Covenant, the picture that was to come, that one day that Jesus would be suspended Folks, it no longer do we need a high priest to go into the Holy of Holies once a year. That that veil was torn. And that law that was in that ark is fulfilled. And Aaron's bud, we have it every day for God's provision. And the manna from heaven, we have the provision. And the Ten Commandments, we have them written on our heart. It's all there. Everything that was pictured in that ark and that ark represented was fulfilled on that cross. And God could not allow David to do the right thing the wrong way. If he did, it would destroy the cross. So when David 
went six steps and put it down. He danced before the Lord with all his might. Now you see why. David didn't just dance before the Lord with all his might because God's presence was coming back to Jerusalem. David danced before the Lord with all his might because David is once again having a new revival in his own soul. Darren, what do you mean? The last 18 months before David become king, he was hiding out in the Philistines. He was tired of King Saul chasing him. And David says one day, and he sighs in the Hebrew language, he sighs, oh, if I just go to the land of the Philistines and make an agreement with the, with the king of the Philistines in the city of Gath, and he will give me my own city with my mighty men, then Saul would quit chasing me. And sure enough, that's what happened. David went among the Philistines, what speaks of the world, Saul quit chasing him, and for 18 months, David lived with the Philistines and learned the Philistines' ways. David allowed his soul to be vexed. So when they came to David and said, David, the ark came here on a new cart. Oh, well, I've been with the Philistines. If the Philistines did it, then it must be okay. And so David allowed the world to influence him. Instead of going back to God's word to see how God wanted his work to be done. I'm going to read a couple of points that I've already mentioned, but just to emphasize them. So David danced for the Lord with all his might because he had a new revival in his soul. The stronghold, the influence of the Philistines was broken on his life. David thought the how made no difference as long as he got the job done. But the how is important. If God tells us how. Familiarity bred contempt. Or indifference and ignorance. I wonder sometimes folks. How often we take for granted the holiness of God. It's amazing to me how God can take an unholy man. Out of an unholy world and make an unholy man holy put him back in the unholy world, and keep him holy. If he has the ability to save us, then he has the ability to keep us. We want the presence of God very much, don't we? But I wonder if we just hitch God's presence to some of our new carts. We like to add him to our list of organizations, to load him on top of our skills and our mechanics of a busy life and drive on. I wonder how much of our personal service is really being done in the energy of the flesh. I wonder if we put forth our hands and our feet more than we put forth our hearts. Again, David attempted to get God's presence without recognizing God's holiness. Amen. You still breathing? Okay. Well, if you'll stand with me tonight, and we're going to pray. And um, Hey, it's still sunshine. What ways to go? I'm going to ask tonight that we would take a few minutes, and maybe start tonight. We can't conclude tonight, but I think it would all be wise if we would begin to ask the Lord starting tonight, God, do I have any new carts in my life? The Bible has given us instructions on how we're to love our wives and our husbands and our children and spend our money and our jobs. And There's pretty much instructions on everything. I wonder sometimes, starting with myself and my family, I wonder sometimes if I've, I've allowed myself to be influenced by the Philistines. It doesn't mean we don't love God. It doesn't mean we're not in a relationship with God doesn't mean we're not going to heaven. But it's possible that we allow ourselves to be vexed and influenced by the world that we find ourselves in. Lot was a puzzling man to me, but the Bible calls him righteous. But it says this, that Lot allowed himself to be vexed by Sodom. 
Lot sat in the leadership of the city of Sodom. Lot wasn't a sodomite. He wasn't a homosexual. He wasn't involved in her activities. But Lot hung around it so much that it knocked the edge off of him. And then when God told him that you're going to die tomorrow, he goes to his children, his sons-in-law, and tells him, flee for your life. The words of men tarry, tarry until the words of God flee for your life. And the Bible says that his own children laughed at him. Here's a man that was going to heaven. But when his kids warned him of wrath to come, they laughed at him. Why? Because his life hasn't been consistent with that warning. They didn't believe him. I wonder sometimes if we've allowed ourselves to lose our edge just because of the world that we find ourselves in. And I think we'd be wise to begin to ask the Lord, Lord, begin to put in my heart tonight and the days ahead areas that I need to go back to your word and to make sure that I do your work your way. Folks, I want God's presence more than anything else in my life. But I don't, and I want to mean this, and I hope I do, but I don't want God just for the sake of wanting God. I want God in everything that it means. In the package. Father, I thank you once again for your word tonight. Lord, I ask you to continue to deal with my family about the carts in our life. Thank you for your mercy. Provision. We thank you for the cross, for the atonement, for your long suffering, your goodness, your kindness, your mercy that endures forever. God, I want to do things the right way. I want your presence. I want your holiness. Whatever is in my life that I've allowed myself to be influenced, I ask that you'd put your finger on that area and that you would help us to do your work the way you want it to be done you'll join me tonight we're going to sing this song and if we'll find a place to pray if you, pray, if you want to pray in your seat and come to the altar but let's just take a few minutes tonight and, and ask God about new cards in our life seated on his throne